Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are joined by none other than Bayham Deputy Mayor Rainy Weisler. The municipality of Bayham is nestled along the scenic shores of Lake Erie and embodies rural charm fused with historical significance. With a population of approximately 7,000 residents, it boasts a rich agricultural heritage and a thriving local economy supported by farming and tourism. Visitors flock to the renowned Port of Burwell Provincial Park for sandy beaches and outdoor recreation. The municipality's heritage sites include the historic lighthouse and HMCS Ojibwe submarine beckons history enthusiasts. Bayam exemplifies small town warmth, community spirit, and Ontario's idyllic countryside allure. This is Cross Border Interviews with Deputy Mayor Rainy Weisler. Rainy, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with my very first question, and it's a question that I've asked every single municipal politician who has ever come on this show, so you are no exception. Where did Got your it. sense of duty to serve your community come from, Rainy? From a very, very, very young age, I won't lie. My remember my mother asking me when I was in public school what I wanted to do when I grew up. And the only answer that I ever had and continue to have to this day is I just want to make a difference. So my love for serving people started right when I got my very first job waiting tables at a small diner in my hometown. And it it has stayed with me throughout my entire life and every career path that I've chosen is dedicated to service, 100%. Where did the desire for political uh, service come in? Because many people could have chosen many different routes to give back through nonprofits, through volunteerism. But you, at the end of the day, decided that politics was where Rainey's voice would be best served. What was it about the municipal realm that drew you to give back in that avenue? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So I would have to say when we, my husband and I moved from a city to a very small rural community, we chose to to move to the municipality of Bayham to start a business and to raise our young family. And when we got there, I was invited from the business community to participate. They were starting a chamber of commerce. And so I joined that organization and sat on the board of directors the whole time that that organization was active and right up until uh, I served as president. So during that time, the municipality would reach out and invite the business community to make comments. And so I had my first introduction to the council chamber, making presentations on behalf of, of the chamber of commerce. So that intrigued me into the process. And then I had been involved in politics in other ways when I was younger, but never on a municipal setting. So I, I, started attending council meetings. So I went just because I was interested and I was, I, I attended council meetings for, Ooh, I would say at least three years before I ran in the first election. And then I was unsuccessful in that election. I ran again, unsuccessful again, and continued to keep in touch with what was going on with our municipality. And then the third time I ran, I was successful. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there for a second here. <laughs> and I, I, I want to start by saying about, I want to talk about the engagement that you, 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 you talk about because the more and more I have these conversations with municipal leaders across Canada, the more and more I'm finding that, Municipal politics was not talked about a lot, probably at the dinner table for a lot of municipal pol politicians now growing up. Um, had you prior to going into the council chambers with the part of being part of the Chamber of Commerce, had you any interest in municipal politics, had any inclinations on what the municipality did, or were you like the average? Canadian thing, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on, I'm a happy camper when it comes to right. what's going on at Town Hall. 
<laughs> well, that's a great, <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because I have, I've had this conversation with many youth because there's this great YouTube video uh, from that TVO did that says who does what. And so there's always this kind of misunderstanding as to what level of government tackles what. And so it's been a really, it's been a journey. I would have to say my interests in politics were always federal. I started debating in high school on the United Nations team, which introduced me to all kinds of uh, opportunity. I debated uh, on a county level. And so my interest was always federal. And yeah, so I would say no, I, I never really looked at municipal politics as where I would have an interest in landing at the beginning. But I'm, I also view my role as a, an elected official differently. I think it's very important for anyone who is in service to understand every level and to participate in every level to the best that they can. So why I decided to move forward in the municipal is so that I could understand that because in the event, my career goal has always been federal. If I ever land there, I think I would make a much better politician federally if I understand how my decisions on a federal level impact the province and thus impact the municipal. And, and it's, it, it's just, it's so instrumental to how everything falls down on the municipalities. And at the end of the day, it falls down on the ratepayer, And that, and that, we have a huge responsibility the the higher level that you go to make sure you're championing for the people at the bottom and so that's always sort of been my take on the whole thing and yeah. i would agree wholeheartedly and i know i know i'm a municipal show and i have a municipal bias but i think federal and provincial politicians are better served when they start at that municipal level not saying that all are are good but i'm saying that there's a better understanding of what the municipality and what municipalities are going through when you start at that level and i i can i look across this great country provincial politicians who start at municipally federal politicians who start at municipally they bring a different unique perspective i want to ask though now that you've been in the position, and correct me if I'm wrong, because Ontario election results are the hardest thing to come by. In 2024, you think they'd be easy to find. But the last time I, the last election that I can find results in, in the municipality of Bayham, is 2018. So I'm okay. pretty sure, as you've just mentioned, that you ran twice and were unsuccessful. I'm going, <laughs> um, this does not match up to the records right. I have. So. <laughs> When did you first put your name forward? Just so that way I have better understanding of what yes. was sort of, I, so so I can ask the next question. What was the first sure. election you ran in? So the first, the very first election I ran in was a by-election. So the deputy mayor at the time had moved and resigned. And so there was a by-election. And I do believe, I don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure it was 2013 and so, and then I ran again in the following uh, election in 2014, I was unsuccessful there. And then I ran again in 2018. And on, then that's when I was successful. So correct and me then if I'm wrong. The, in the, so the municipality of Bayham, they elect their deputy mayor as a position. It's not a councillor then elected as mayor. It's a, just a that's deputy correct. mayor position. That's good to understand. <laughs> so. I want to go back to that 2013 election, if you don't mind. Mm. So let's go back to that by-election. I know it's a unique situation because it is a by-election, but right. you run an election in every situation the exact same way unless you're acclaimed. Do you remember the issues that you were hearing at the doorsteps when you were door knocking? Because the question I'm going to ask follow up is, have those issues changed compared to what you heard in the last general election. Now, I do realize that in 2022, you were acclaimed to the position of deputy mayor, right. but mm -hmm. I'm assuming you were still talking to your residents, addressing what they were sort of going through. Has the issues changed a lot in the municipality of Bayham from when you first were uh, interested in municipal politics to today? I would say... 
Hmm. That's a great question. I just, I would say that the issues are very similar in that it becomes, it's, it's a discussion surrounding level of service. So the, dis, the discussion is level of service. People want to know what are my tax dollars getting me and why are my services going away and my taxes going up? So that discussion, I don't think that's ever going to go away. But the answer to the question becomes more, as the years go on, they become very complex, much more complex than they were when I first ran. So it it does become very much, yeah. So the, the, the reason the reason I asked that is because you mentioned something that is very much in my purview of my wheelhouse of this show. You talk to the kids about that TVO clip about the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays. And I am mm -hmm. a big proponent on this show that the municipality has a role and a responsibility that they play in every single day. You yeah. as an elected official understand those purviews. You in the you understand the jurisdictional roles. But the average resident does not care about those jurisdictional roles. They will come to you with healthcare issues. They will come to you with education issues. They will come to you with federal issues, for God's sakes, because that's what yeah. we are in. How do you as an elected official, knowing that you have a role to play in the grand scheme of the jurisdiction of governance, ensure that the issues are addressed in a way that you don't just brush off people's concerns because you are the closest to the people you are there on the grounds in the grocery stores at the baseball fields in the hockey arenas and when they come to you with a healthcare issue which is a provincial and federal jurisdiction you have to sort of try to answer it without saying that's not my role go talk to your mpp right it's a very good point and i think the the most important thing that i can do as in, in my role as deputy mayor in the municipality of Bayham, the most important thing I can do is listen. And I can listen and I can take notes and I can be engaged in that conversation. And then I can, like you said, yes, it, it may be a matter of directing them to the right level, but it may also be ensuring that those concerns, those deep rooted concerns that are ongoing, that have been ongoing for years, that we provide that catalyst to be the voice to that next level. So one of the things that I have done personally, that's been very important to me is that I make sure that I'm involved and engaged at different levels of government so that Bayham's voice can be part of that discussion at the at the table. So being able to have roundtable discussions with members of provincial parliament and members of parliament. I sit on the AMO board, the Roma board. I, I'm anything I can do to champion change for a small a small rural municipality, I'm gonna do it. My goal when I put my name forward as an elected official, my goal was to champion change for our area but also to bring a voice to small business. That was a huge issue for me just because I was a small business owner and I know what it's like to be slogging at 90 hours a week for the last 15 years and wondering where your next paycheck is going to come from. Like I am so empathetic to where people are today. And sadly, you know, you look at the environment and the culture right now and, and it really is a little, it's bleak and, the idea that I could be part of a long-term positive change for my community, it it just makes me want to stay in the trenches as long as I can and do and work as hard as I can to keep making sure that that those upper levels here that we're struggling and we need the assistance and 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 we're here and we want to be heard and we might be small, but we're mighty. You know, like it's amazing what a small community can do when they they pull together for each other. And it's it's amazing. It's it's been an absolute it's been an honor of a lifetime, to be honest. I, I want to talk about the role of council for a few seconds and particularly your role on council. 
Now, you have now been on council since 2018, so we're looking mm -hmm. at almost six years from when you first were elected to today as of mm -hmm. recording this episode. Um, I can imagine you've had to make some very tough decisions around budgets, around service levels, around this, that, or the other. Um, you know 100% of the people of your community are not going to agree with 100% of the decisions you make. It just comes with the territory, and I don't care who you are. Uh, it, it's just it's the name of the game of politics. How do you, as the deputy mayor, as an integral voice on that council, make sure that the this decisions you are making are in the best interest of all of Bayham? And not just a select few, because you are there to represent everyone, even those who didn't vote for you or don't agree with you. But you, at the end of the day, have to make a tough choice to say, OK, how is this in the better good of the entire community and not just a few select people? And, and that's a great question, mostly because communication and, and community engagement has always been a bit of a criticism around our horseshoe so it's it's really it is challenging when you look for feedback from your constituents and really you're you're only getting like you mentioned earlier you you may only get the feedback from a few and there's going to be times when and particularly during budgets when every year the budgets get tighter the, there's not as much money coming down from the province or the federal government. So then you have to, you have to tighten even more and, and, and heaven forbid you have a, a situation like we're in right now where there's a little bit of, we have some bad debt on our books that we're trying to get rid of. So everybody is feeling the pressure and the sacrifice. So when, when you're saying, tell us what you want, and then they tell you what they want and you can't deliver that, that's even that's that's even more of a struggle just because the finances just aren't there but when are i was people, first are people willing to engage with you in bayham like when you go ask people for their opinion is there do you find an apathetic tone or are actually people interested but they have to be sort of poked and prodded to sort of give you the response that you're looking for so yeah absolutely i i if there's one thing i regret about shutting down our business is that i'm I didn't realize how accessible I was when we operated a business that was open to the public, right? So people knew where they could find me. They knew that I was available, right? So it, it's a totally different environment now because when I was used to people just coming in and giving me their opinions, now I have to say, I really want your opinion. Like, I need you to tell me what's going on, right? Uh, it's interesting because when you when you run a small business in a small community, you hear everything that's wrong with how the municipality operates, and then you get elected, and suddenly they stop telling you anything. It's like, Everything's sunshine and roses once you get elected, don't you know? Come on, Randy, you should know that. I was like, wait a second, I need to know. Like, gotta you gotta keep telling me what's going on. But no, but the reality is, I made a commitment during my first election cycle that if I were elected, that I would be in the council chamber a minimum of, of 30 minutes before every meeting, that if anyone wanted to speak with me, I would be available. That was public. I made that public. So, and that's something that I have never, with the exception of twice when I had to zoom in, uh, where I wasn't able to be in the council chamber, uh, I have, I've always maintained that commitment to my community. I do have an open door policy the the reality is a lot of what I'm seeing, the trend that I see today is people will engage in social media platforms. They will engage with their, their peers and their members of the community. But oftentimes that information doesn't come to council in a, in a manner that we can action it. So if, you know, if, if something's in writing and comes to, or comes to me directly with a phone call or something, we can action those things, but somebody leaving a comment on, on a Facebook page is not something that I can, like, it's not an appropriate means of communicating issues to the people that can actually take that and, and do something with it. You, I you're think preaching we're preaching to the choir to get... here. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah. Get off I, I really, media. 
I really think we're going to have to get creative on how we govern moving forward and, and sort of maybe putting policies in place on what's appropriate when it comes to social media, because it really is not everybody is there. So not everybody has an Instagram page or is, is part of, uh, X or whatever they call it now, or, and not everybody has a Facebook page. And, and let's be, if we're going to be brutally honest, not everybody has the infrastructure to be connected. So until we get to that place where we can say this is fair, there has to be alternative ways to communicate with the public. Now, whether that's newsletters and their in their water bills and tax bills, whether that's, we do have a website that we direct people to quite often. We try different means of communication with uh, different platforms like Voyant Alert, which will alert people of things that are, you know, dire situations in the community that need attention. So it, there are different ways, but I've always tried to maintain a very open door policy that, I would like to hear from you and I'm available and there's multiple ways to reach me. Sadly, social media platforms, I I try not to engage in very much just because I just don't find that as a, as an appropriate means. But to, to me, it's not the real world. And that's just me saying that as the host of the show, not the deputy mayor. So anyone who's going to send nasty emails, please send them my way. Um <laughs> I want to sort of pick up a little bit on that before we move to the second segment, which is talking about the municipality as a whole. How important is it for you to listen to all sides of the story? Because any councilor, any deputy mayor, any mayor has to go into every single meeting with an open mind on how they're going to vote. Yes, you have a potential way that you're going to vote when you step into that council meeting. But at the end of the day, when you sit in that council, in that horseshoe, you have to hear people's delegations. You have to hear all sides. You have to hear from your fellow councilors, your mayor, and maybe that may sway your vote. How important is it when you're approaching every single issue to hear from all sides of the sort of the, the I, I don't want to say problem, but all sides of the uh, pie in some sense to make sure that what you're voting on may be something you didn't think about 10 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago, or even may go in and go, oh, I did not think that this was a solution. And now that I know it, let's vote for it that I thought I was going to vote against it beforehand. That is a fabulous question. It actually it reminded me of, I'm going to tell you a story to answer that question, if that's okay. Go for it. So, that's why we call this a show and not a <laughs> two second interview. Um, when I first started attending council years and years ago, there was a contentious issue in the community that had come up and there was information flooding in from everywhere. And it was, it was interesting. And I remember council of the day in their decision-making process, one meeting, they would go one way and defer. And then the next meeting they would come back and they'd go another way and defer. And it was just kind of on a teeter totter. And I thought this is the most interesting process that I've ever experienced. So I remember I sent a letter and it's the only time that I had sent a letter to council ever. And I sent a letter and I said that it was embarrassing to see the flipping and flopping and changing your mind. And my recommendation to council was make a decision and stick with the decision. I'm going to fast forward that to my life as an elected official. There's a reason why decisions change. And information, the flow of information comes at you in different ways at different times. And sometimes it's the speed of light and sometimes it's slow as molasses, right? So I I always try and look at an issue in a manner that I know it's evolving. It's always evolving. And the information is always changing and we're more information becomes available 
maybe there's some clarity maybe it adds more questions i'm i i used to think that it it was poor i'm trying to find the right word um leadership poor leadership if you appeared to sit on the fence i was i've been criticized of that a lot because my initial reaction to anyone that has an issue is to listen and uh, immediately when somebody's telling you a story and you are engaged and you're listening they automatically think that you agree and that's not necessarily the case the case is i'm listening I'm taking in that information, I'm processing that information, and I, I'm still going to have to come up with a decision that I believe is the best decision for the entire municipality. Maybe not for just you, we have to consider everybody else. And so, yes, it's it's not, it's expected that I- Can I ask a I, question on that? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. How important is conviction in your role as a deputy mayor? Because you're right. You have to live by those decisions that you make and you have to look at every issue and take in all the information you gather, whether it be from people that you agree with, people you disagree with. But at the end of the day, your conviction that you've done the right thing in the moment is the only thing that you can stand by. When you lay your head down at night, you have to live by that conviction yourself to say, right. I've done the best I can do with the information I have gleaned. Yes, people make mistakes. Yes, people yes. 10, 10, 10 years from now, heck, 20 minutes from now, something could change and the information could be different. Is conviction important to you when you make those decisions? Absolutely. For sure. It has to be. That's what we're elected to do. And there are times when information has come after a decision has been made. And then you go, I probably wouldn't have made that decision had that information been available. Do I feel like I make mistakes? Absolutely. Do Human. I sometimes, <laughs> you know, like, do I wish that things would be different? For sure. But at the same time, I have to, tr you have to trust your staff. You have to empower them to gather information, all the information and present as much information as they can so that we can make the best educated decision that we have, that we can. And if, if, you know, so I, I really do keep an eye on that council staff relationship because that really is important and and there are going to be times when people criticize council that say you know oh you let staff dictate what you're doing not necessarily but their role is to provide us with the information consult with the people that have way more expertise than i'll ever hope to have and then bring to council what they feel is the best decision and recommendation for the information that we have. What at the end of the day, it truly is up to council whether we accept that recommendation or not. So yes, we do, you know, we do have final say, but we also have to have a, a positive working relationship with with all of those individuals to make sure that the best information is coming forward. I appreciate your answer on that. And I am cautious of time here. So I'm going to turn to oh, segment yeah. two. So okay. prior to asking the first question in segment two, I'm going to preface this as I always do. So anyone who's listened to the show before, skip forward about 20 seconds because you're about to hear the same <laughs> ramble I give on every single episode. This is a Love conversation it. between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion. For those who are about to send nasty emails, please send them to me so I can file them away in the appropriate location. Deputy Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing your community today? We have some really amazing opportunities coming to Ontario in terms of economic growth. And I think one of the biggest things for smaller municipalities like the municipality of Bayham is how can we 
capitalize and grow with the rest of the province when we have very we have a lot of challenges when it comes to infrastructure and debt so yeah i would say that is the biggest issue how can we eliminate bad debt and how can we grow so that we can thrive like our neighbors are going to thrive is that hard because you you and i both know that municipalities are under a lot of financial strain right now you uh, are seeing funding cuts from the province from the federal government you are seeing transfers not happening as much as they were and if they are they are not keeping up with inflation that we are seeing right now and that means municipalities are asked being asked to do more with even less money um right. And I'm not trying to sort of ask the political question here, but I'm kind of have to. Is the municipality of Bayham in a financial shape that 10 years from now, you will be able to look back now and say, okay, that was a tough part moment in our community's history, but we got through it and we're on the other side better off. Give me some hope that the municipality is going to be able to weather somewhat of the storm. I think we are in a position where in 10 years we can look back and say we did well. I, I I really I do believe that. I think our goal, our goal as as council has been to eliminate that bad debt so that we can be competitive for future funding opportunities. Can I ask a question? What do you mean by bad debt? Debt, because when debt. when I'm yeah bad death, of course bad death is bad, but <laughs> bad debt as you're right. Mm -hmm. What what do you mean by bad debt? Because I, I when I'm thinking of bad debt, I'm thinking like outstanding property taxes that no what you haven't been able right. to collect. You're I'm thinking of utility payments that people weren't able to pay for, or is there something else that I'm missing here? And I'm not don't go into the weeds here. Just it, like mm -hmm. overview it for me if possible, so that right. way I understand and my listeners understand. Yeah. So, so predating my, my term, like my time on council, uh, the council of the day did guarantee a loan for a museum and that museum, they defaulted on that loan. And so the municipality is responsible for the $6 million loan. So what happens when you have that debt where it's not going toward infrastructure or growth, it's just sitting there. It's hard to borrow it for much needed infrastructure when you have that as a liability. So when I, when we refer to it as bad debt, we're like, let's, let's get rid of that. It opens up then our future debt capacity yeah, so that we yeah. can, now we can get shovel ready projects in the infrastructure, in the ground. You know, we have opportunity to, to do some infilling and, and grow with with housing and things like that but we have to make sure that we have the pipes in the ground and the infrastructure in order to do it and that costs a lot of money and there's only so much you can download to your developer and then you know the goal is to be building affordable housing so it's it the it's a big spiral it, it it's this catch 22 you know when you're looking at a 10 year budget which has a $35 million line for water wastewater infrastructure that you're going to need in order to be competitive over the next 10 years, where is that money coming from? And when you're lobbying the upper levels of government and they're saying, yes, we're going to, you know, we've opened up the these different funding opportunities and grant opportunities, and we have, you know, 200 million for the entire province. And they're saying, and and on top of that, we will be looking towards those projects that are shovel ready that have all of the studies and everything in place. When every single study you do is between twenty to sixty thousand, you know, if your municipality can't even afford the study, how can you know? So it's it's this. It is a vicious cycle. So it's always constantly looking for funding opportunities to make sure that we stay competitive, so that we can capitalize on the economic development that that we we have such a beautiful municipality, and we have so much to offer our residents. 
you know, we live on the beautiful shores of Lake Erie. It's, it's absolutely stunning. We have a beautiful provincial park in our, in our community. It, and the people, the people are really what make Bayham Bayham and why people come back. I'd love to see some more industry there. I'd love to see some more, some more uh, commercial growth so that we can increase the, the tax levy and not tax levy, but we can increase our tax base so that we can give more back to the community. Now I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when I cut, when it comes to talking about municipalities in segment two. So I flipped the script a lot in this part of the, the show <laughs> and I'm going to say, and I'm going to ask you point blank, what does your municipality do right? What is the thing that when you go to Roma, when you go to AMO, you boast about when you say to other municipal leaders, you know what, you might be doing it good. Bayham's doing it better. What is that thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh man we ha i have to i have to give credit where credit is due we we do we have a wonderful uh senior staff that are just phenomenal at keeping up on regulations our, our water wastewater manager is stellar like i i they always tease me because i i like going down to the wastewater plant i think it's awesome down there you know <laughs> so i i do I do think we we do very well with uh, development of our staff and. Okay, I'm going to interject for two seconds. When you said senior staff, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You have a program <laughs> dedicated towards seniors, but no, you're talking about managers and directors. Okay, Sorry. I apologize because when you went to wastewater, I was like, what what's Rainy talking about here? No. I am I am so <laughs> that I was like like oh, okay, continue. I apologize. Your senior Sorry. staff is amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. No, we have, we do have a great staff and they, and uh, they, they work very hard. It's a very lean staff. Uh, we, and we've won awards for, for innovation in how we use technology to make sure we're ticking all the boxes and doing a great job and, and uh, getting, getting all of the, we, we have to remember and we forget as residents that there's so many regu we're almost over-regulated. And there's so many requirements that we have and things that we have to we have to do in terms of reporting that any way that they can figure out to 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 make positive changes is great. Um, so, yeah. What else do we do? Right. Well, we have a wonderful agricultural community. We are feeding hundreds and thousands of people <laughs> and we're very, very blessed to have a, a you know, a great farming community that, that gives back to the community as well. And that's uh, amazing. And we have some wonderful organizations within the community that have partnered with the municipality over the years to put on festivals and outreach for our neighbors. And, and that makes a big difference too. So I appreciate that. Before I turn to my last segment, which is my favorite segment, which is tourism, I have one last question for you. And I ask it all the time because on the show, if you haven't noticed by now, for those who are listening, I am a big Star Trek fan. And oh. there's a quote from the movie Wrath of Khan that Spock says to Kirk about the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few or the one. Now, you know that if I go talk to 100 people in your community tomorrow, they'll tell me 100 different issues that their community, they believe their community is going through right now. You, at the end of the day, have to sort of dissect every single issue and understand that municipalities don't have an unlimited supply of money. So you have to pick sort of somewhat the winners and the losers. Mm -hmm. You have to say your issue is not as important this year, maybe two years from now, maybe a year from now, your road is not going to be upgraded because John's road in front of his house is a lot worse or Main Street is a lot worse. This pipe needs to be fixed over your pipe, potholes, service levels, you name it. How important is it for you when you're dealing with people who do have issues to be honest with them about the realities that the municipality is currently in with their issues that they're facing? Because you want to make sure that the municipality's taxes, when they, when the property owner pays them, they're being spent that the property owner feels like they're being somewhat serviced by those property taxes. It's a great question because it is, you've nailed it. It is so, so challenging. P 
particularly in the last few years of of the the budget cycle for our municipality because my my colleagues and I really really want to eliminate the bad debt that I referred to earlier as so that we can give back to the community in a positive way where they can see those changes. So a lot of the dialogue that I have when people are coming to me saying, wow, I have a lot of concerns with, with these taxes and you, you, you're killing us kind of thing. You know, we, why are you doing this? And it's always, the messaging has always been very, the same messaging across the board has always been like, hang in there. Like we, we're asking for this for a couple years and then we're going to see some relief. So just, we just need to hang in there and we're all in it together. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people, when they're criticizing the decisions that we make around that horseshoe, what they, what they forget is that we are residents of the municipality of Bayham too. And our taxes are going up too. And it's hard. It's, it's hard. It sucks right now. Inflation is horrible. You know, we're seeing projects that we really wanted to do. We have to put on the back burner now. You, you, you alluded to a few of them. You know, we've got roads that we've put aside. We've got potholes that we're not looking at. And it it is, it's really hard because when I was first elected, you go into the role. And if I'm pretty sure you've probably interviewed a lot of people. So <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this a lot. Some people will run on one issue, right? They're mad about that pothole. So they're going to run and they're going to make changes. I love the passion, but for someone like myself who sat in the council chamber for 15 years before I was elected, I also, I, I, I came in knowing that, yes, I w really wanted to champion change, but change is slow. Change has a big, it has a process, a big process. And sometimes you get halfway through and, and it still doesn't happen. And on, on, and on, but on top of that, you have to, yeah, you just have to do the very best that you can and yep. you just have to keep working really hard. What advice yeah. would you give a prospective council candidate that is potentially thinking about running for council? Because I know we're this, I should have asked this before in the first segment, but you, you just talked about that 15 year experience of sitting in those council meetings prior to getting elected. What yeah. advice would you give to a prospective candidate? Because Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, Yukon, New, uh, Nova Scotia, if I'm not mistaken, are all going to municipal elections. And we have listeners in every one of those provinces and territories. What advice would you give those prospective candidates who say, you know what, I want to get involved, but I really don't know what is involved with being a municipal politician? Two pieces of advice. <laughs> Don't ever think that your voice doesn't deserve to be heard. I don't care what educational background you have. I don't care what you do. If you have a passion to serve your community, don't be afraid to put your name forward. The second piece of advice is attend a council meeting. I know it sounds silly, but council is boring. It it can as, be as someone who watches council meetings on a regular basis from across Canada, <laughs> I would not agree with you on that at all. <laughs> you know, the, the the process, the requirements, like they're daunting. They take a long time. You're, you know, uh, planning applications like God bless our planner, because I don't know how like some days I like my eyes are rolling in the back of my head. Sometimes, it, you know, it'll take me three three kicks at the can to get through a report so that I fully understand it because the material is, can be very dry. It at this, the flip side of that is that it can be very exciting and it's, it is an absolute honor to work with a team, a team that works well together and effective. So yeah, my advice would be attend a meeting, go to the so that you can see like even the simple things like reading Robert's rules of how meetings are conducted, how to best present yourself at that meeting. Like there's nothing that I hate more than, 
you know, there is a flow, like address the chair correctly. There are expectations when you are an elected member because you're there to represent the people that you're there to represent. And you need to do that and to the best of your ability, come to your meetings prepared, read your agendas, ask staff questions. Um, but for sure, the first thing is, is if you have any interest at all, and and if I can, I'll plug the event we talked about earlier. I, I if If I can, I'll segue that right in there. You know, we still only see less than 30% of women on council. So, you know, we have an opportunity to engage with our community. I hear, you know, I talked to a deputy mayor in a, in a, in a neighboring community who said the only reason she got involved in politics at all was because her kids were attending a mock council assembly and she went because her son was doing a presentation to council. And so she went just to listen to it and that intrigued her. And so she started going to council meetings and now she's the deputy mayor. You know what? There, We need people to come forward, step forward, get out of your comfort zone. We, Everybody deserves a voice. Everybody has a right at that table. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I worked really, really hard to get here, but I would mentor anybody in a day who, you know, any day to uh, to to step forward. So my colleagues and I in the, in Elgin County are planning a women in leadership event for any women that are out there that are thinking about coming, uh, being part of council or or looking at taking on any leadership role. On August or sorry, on April the twenty seventh, April the twenty seventh, we are hosting a conference for women. And we would love for you to check that out. You can look at that on Eventbrite. And that's hosted by the Gene Collective. For those, and who, Elgin are, County. For those who are interested in learning more about that uh, leadership conference, the links will be in the show notes and on the Cross Border Interviews website. So head over to uh, this episode on the Cross Border Interviews website, and then the link will be in the show notes uh, moving forward until April 2nd, because it is an important project that I believe more, more and more women should get involved, because like the deputy mayor just said, 30% is a number that we should not be aiming for. We should be aiming for higher and we should be getting more women involved in politics. So links in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching, <laughs> listening to this via audio, head over to the cross border interviews website and click on uh deputy mayor uh, episode, whatever this episode you're listening to this, whatever the number is, I don't know it right now, but whatever <laughs> episode number it is, check it out on the website because you will not want to miss it. And the links will be in the show notes. Get your tickets tonight. So Thank just you. want to give that sh 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 small little plug before Thank I you. let you go. I want to turn to my last subject because I have said I've made this pledge and I'm going to make sure that I do it in Southwestern Ontario this year. And if you come on this show, I am coming to your community. So I'm going to spend a day in your community in 2024. So you better have some great tourist destinations for me to visit. I love it. As someone who has listeners from across Canada and around the world, what are some of the great tourist destinations, the hidden gems in your community that people should come and see in BAM? Awesome. Oh my goodness. Well, uh, well, we have the beautiful, we have our beach. So uh, we have the Port Burwell Provincial Park and it, we have also a municipal public beach with free parking. And it's absolutely amazing. And right down in Port Burwell as well, we have the oldest lighthouse on the shores of Lake Erie. So we have a beautiful uh, wooden lighthouse. And we also have the HMCS Ojibwa, which is a cold uh, Cold War era sub submarine. And that is a that's a museum that's open to the public. You can take that tour. So that's awesome. We have some great museums and libraries and, oh my goodness, there's all kinds of good stuff. I can't wait for you to come down. I'm going to take you on a tour, one end to the other. That's what <laughs> I like to hear. I'm going to ask you to play a little bit of Sophie's Choice here for a second, because I always ask this question to follow up. That is, where do you go in the community? Where do you go in the community? Where's your spot that you go to decompress after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work that you know that you can go to? recenter yourself because you know tomorrow you're gonna to have to make some tough decisions again i love to hear the water down at the beach 
the waves coming in. But if I, if it's busy and I really need a place to decompress, I'm, you're going to laugh, but we have some beautiful cemeteries, old cemeteries, and they're kind of off the beaten path. And there's one, especially in Vienna that I really like to go. And it's, it's, it's just a neat place. It's very quiet and it, it it's well-maintained and it's nice, very nice. So yeah, I, I, anywhere where it's nice and quiet. I have done almost 200 episodes with municipal <laughs> counselors and you, you are the very heard of somebody going to the cemetery usually i get i go to my house i go to my basement i go to my little <laughs> bar you are the very first that says i go to a cemetery and fyi i'm coming because i'm one of those people that takes he- photos of headstones of oh this is a famous person <laughs> Oh, I got I have the best places for you, Chris. I can't wait. <laughs> awesome. So before I let you go, we started talking about you on the show. We're going to end by asking the million dollar question to end the show. And oh, I think boy. it's a, a question that every municipal leader knows how to answer, but I'd like to put it on the record. In your okay. opinion, what makes the municipality of Bayham such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I love its proximity to urban and yet it's rural. So it doesn't take us very long to get where we need to go to find all of those amenities, but it's it's a quiet place to go to, and like you said, to recharge. The people here are absolutely fantastic. It really is the definition of a community. I've, I've really, it's an honor to raise my family here And it's an honor to serve the people here. Rainy, um, I want to thank you. (laughs) I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule and doing this interview. But I also want to take a moment and say this. Thank you for serving. I do not think municipal politicians hear that enough. And it's high time that we start. You are the level of government that is the closest to the people and makes the biggest impact into day-to-day lives of everyone who you serve. Um, I can imagine there are days that it's tough. There are days that it is easy, but the, the tough days outweigh the easy days because those are the tough decisions you have to make. And you have, in the last 45 minutes, close to an hour of talking, have made me so appreciative that I'm able to tell your story a little bit on this show and showcase the amazing work that you're doing, but also the amazing work that the municipality of Bayham is doing. Um, Thank you so much for being part of the show and for being just who you are. I feel like we're (laughs) old friends and we've only known each other for less than an hour. So that tells you how much, how much you have rubbed off on me. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Just a reminder that all the links that we talked about in today's episode will be in the show notes on YouTube or on the Cross Border Interviews website. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button or follow button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or even small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. 